Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining from. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. My name is John Morton. I am a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, uh, a partner at the Pollination Group, a specialist climate change advisory and investment firm, and the former senior director for national security, uh, for, for energy and climate change at the National Security Council under President uh, Obama. As part of the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center fireside chat series, the virtual fireside chat series, I should say. We are honored today to be joined by Francesco La Camera uh, of the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, or IRENA, for a timely discussion on the future of renewable energy in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, please note to all participants that this event is on the record and that we're currently live streaming on Atlantic Council Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, and we encourage you, obviously, to post about what you're hearing today uh, and share on social media using the hashtags at AC Energy and by tagging us at, at AC Global Energy. Uh, just to note that this will be a very interactive conversation and we encourage all of your questions um, as we go. We'll be taking them, uh, uh, we'll be keeping a, a, running, a running list and, and I'll be trying to get them to Mr. Lakamara as we, as we proceed in the conversation. Um, you can uh, click on the Q&A portal located at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit a question. So I'll now introduce our, uh, our, our guest and the organization that he leads, starting with that organization. Um, IRENA, for those of you not familiar with it, uh, is the International Renewable Energy Agency. Uh, it is a leading environmental uh, inter intergovernmental organization focused on the global energy transformation. Uh, the energy supports countries uh, in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serves as a principal platform for international cooperation, a center of excellence and a repository of, uh, of policy, technology, resource and financial knowledge on the renewable energy transition. Um, it has 161 members, including the European Union, uh, and there are an additional 22 uh, countries in the accession process currently. Uh, Mr. La Camera is the Director General of the agency, a position that he's held for uh, just almost exactly a year now, um, a position that he took over from Adnan Amin, the former uh, DG, who I should just note as a matter of uh, course is a, also a distinguished senior fellow at the, uh, at the Atlantic Council, and so the ties between the Atlantic Council and IRENA are, are strong indeed. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here today, Mr. La Camera. Um, Prior to IRENA, he served as Director General for Sustainable Development, Energy and Climate at the Italian Ministry of Environment, Land and Sea. Um, he has led EU and Italian negotiation teams to the various conference of the parties over the years um, uh, and is no stranger to climate diplomacy and the renewable energy industry as a whole. Um, he has represented Italy in many international forum at the EU, UNEP and the OECD. He's been a professor uh, in, in Rome and he has a degree in political science from the University of Messina. So welcome to you, Mr. La Camera. It's a real pleasure to have you here, have you back, I should say. I know some of you are joining us again after uh, some technical difficulties that we had earlier in the week. So uh, welcome back to those of you joining again and welcome to the, for the first time to those of you joining uh, this, this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. I'll set a brief bit of context and then we'll get brief, uh, then we'll get quickly to conversation. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, as the coronavirus uh, continues to uh, wage uh, around the world, um, we have been reminded once again of the urgent need for energy and electricity, reliable energy and electricity for our healthcare workers, critical workers, et cetera, um, to say nothing of the need for uh, a, a solid and reliable supply of energy as we uh, now uh, work from home. Um, uh, however, as international oil prices have continued um, a rapid uh, descent and, and continuing volatility, um, uh, many of us are wondering about what the impact of that will be on the growth of renewable energy. Um, and though the uh, current economic recession and downturn will certainly limit the capital available for all sorts of uh, industries, including renewable energy, um, the unpredictability of commodity markets um, and diminishing returns in hydrocarbon investment, uh, some are arguing may make renewables an increasingly advantageous investment as we emerge from the current crisis. Uh, and that's before we think about the uh, potential effects of recovery and stimulus funds on the future 
uh, energy investment trends and patterns that we are likely to see coming out of this uh, coming out of this crisis. And surely the renewable ener energy industry would receive a significant boost if key governments decide to prioritize sustainable and climate friendly recovery strategies. And I think that's something that we'll want to touch on in this in this conversation in some detail. So today we'll cover a range of topics. Really, um, I'll start with a few questions, but we're going to be integrating your comments as we go and questions. So please, again, um, tee them up on, on the Q&A function below. Um, We'll want to talk about what role does IRENA play in advancing renewable energy policy uh, and deployment? Um, what have we learned about from past stimulus efforts uh, that, that is relevant to today's conversation about how we apply funds and financing going forward? Um, and how can we ensure collectively that um, the investments that we make over the next couple of years are indeed targeted towards, uh, towards sectors and strategies that are resilient, strong, and uh, pave a way to a 21st century economy um, as opposed to embedding uh, the, the increasing inefficiencies of, um, of, of last century's economy. And we'll take your questions, obviously, along the way. So with that, um, with that brief introduction, I welcome back, Mr. LaCamera. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And I thought maybe a place for us to start before we get into the conversation about emerging from coronavirus, it's a bit presumptuous for us to do that uh, right off the bat. Let's talk a little bit about where we were in the renewable energy uh, tra uh, transformation in the, in, in the industry? What are some of the trends that you've seen prior to coronavirus? Just help ground us on where we, where we are today with respect to the energy industry. So thanks. Uh, thanks, John, for the opportunity to, to meet you again, virtually, after our, our meeting uh, a few days ago. And uh, I think that this uh, conversation is very timely, as I, as I say. This is the moment where it's very, uh, very good to, to, to make a reasoning about what was happening, what is happening with the COVID and where we are going. Concern what was happening and uh, on your uh, question, what we have assisted in the last here is a continuous trend, a confirmation of a continuous trend where the installed capacity of renewables have systematically outpaced the installed capacity of the traditional plant. Last year, three quarter of the installed capacity came from renewables. And now except one year, a uh, nine year in a row, that installed capacity of uh, renewable are outpacing the old one. And wh what is the reason for, for, for it? So naturally, renewables have enjoyed a certain policy that uh, some years ago has been put in place to push the renewables. But for the time being, for nowadays, what is the real reason for having this extraordinary path of installing capacity renewables is just the market. So if the zero between the two trends of the two installed capacity, renewables and traditional fossil fuel plant is enlarging year by year is because renewables are becoming year by year more convenient. So the actual trend is based mainly on the market working. We have seen in the, the last auction, wind, solar, that has been breaking any previous previous uh, previous record. We now count more than three hundred billion dollars of investment renewable per year. So we are really on uh, a path that, in my point of view, was and it is unstoppable. The only question we had at the end of the last year, if this process was fast enough if we went to compare to the need to decarbonize our economy, to be in line with the Paris Agreement goals, that means just having a, a energy system that could be sustainable for the modern and modern society. So I think it's 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 uh, it's it's really fascinating the numbers that you that you just laid out, and I and I just want to I want to echo them, and and because I I, I certainly know within the U.S. context um, those numbers are 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 not well understood. I think renewables is still thought of as a as a side industry, as a small industry. But what what I heard you just say was that for nine years in a row, uh, renewable energy 
uh, new renewable installed capacity has outpaced fossil fuel and that last year 75% of new installed capacity globally was in renewable ener energy. I think those are astonishing statistics and what I hear you saying there is that those are market driven as much as anything at this point and so very hard to kind of put back in the bottle um, if you will. Um, so so let, let's 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 take that a step further. We, we now have um, we now have a situation where oil prices are very very low, um, and let's let's talk a little bit about the implication of of sustained low oil prices um, uh, on the renewable industry. What does that do to the market, um, and what do you project will will happen over the next uh, year or two? I know you have a report coming up very soon. Um, potentially maybe getting into some of these issues, but uh, tell us about what low oil prices do to renewables. Uh, I have said this uh, many times in the last week. So we don't estimate a direct impact of the oil price on, on renewables as such. Naturally, renewables will be impacted by COVID. And the main impact for the renewables will come from the supply chain, will come from the fact the factory has to close to maintain social distance. So these are more than just the, the oil, uh, uh, the prices, the reason for having difficulties in renewables, in the renewable sector. But uh, the difficulties that the sector is encountering, is going to encounter in relative terms, are much less important than impact in other sectors. There are entire economic sector, entire energy sector that are risking to be strained out by this situation of, uh, of price. So when we consider this in the future, I think that government will be looking for a system that could be more resilient to shocks coming from any kind of risk, but it's important that they have uh, the, the potential, the capacity to resist to the shock. And if we look to renewables, just for the characteristic of the sector, this is the best way we are, we are to go. There is no doubt. Naturally, and hopefully, will exist because the demand will become to rise and we all await this, uh, this moment, naturally the oil price may come a little bit higher. But their investment in oil will be no a reasonable choice today. They will become very shortly stranded assets. Mm -hmm. So we have also assisted also in the United States in the last year, many power plants just dismiss it. I mean, the traditional plant and going for a more renewable, sp renewable space in the market. So I think that the trend in the long term will be not affected by the price, but by the force that the renewables have in market terms and also in social terms to provide for a more economical and resilient energy system in a sustainable world. Excellent. So I'm going to ask the question now that uh, that flows from that. That this is the question where we got in trouble last time and where we where we had a we had a, a connection issue. So hopefully we can we can get get through it this time. This <laughs> we can test see if we that was the reason. That's right. We'll see if this is the reason. This is a question of subsidies. A very a very tricky political thorny political question. It's an issue I worked on quite a bit when I was in the administration. Um, as you know, since since the uh, G7 in Pittsburgh years and years ago, there has been an outstanding. There has been an outstanding pledge by uh, by the leading industrialized nations to uh, to take steps to uh, get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. Um, these run to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year, um, and you know there's um, there's never a better moment to do that. Economists and others argue than when oil prices are low, um, and so I, I wonder does does Irina have a position on on this? These are these are obviously in some ways market distorting subsidies. Um, and I wonder what your uh, your position is or whether you have a view on fossil fuel subsidy reform in light of the current market trends. Yeah, you know, the position of uh, Arena on this is very clear because on the first global renewable outlook 
that is, will come out on the 20th of April, where we uh, design the path for staying in line with the goal of the decarbonize the economy, we have a shift also in terms of the money that, that has to go from the subsidies in fossil fuel to renewable. This is an essential maneuver to be taken. And the fact is that we have been talking in all forum about this, and not everyone is against it, but we may understand that it is not an easy thing to do. We just talked a few days ago on the uh, what happened when the French government was trying to introduce uh, a carbon tax on, uh, on certain sector, and the people went into the street because the people could feel the difference in terms of price. Here, when the price is going down, is making a space free for cutting the subsidies. So, from a social point of view, it is the best way to do it, the best moment, because this will not cause social disruption. So the price is so low that there is no any disruption to be caused. And the fact that there is no demand is not a question of price. It's a question that there is no demand. So this is the right moment for doing this job. And this could help much the switch, the, the increase the rapidity of the moving towards renewable. We estimate that uh, something like 15 trillions of uh, subsidies has to move from the old to the new sector. And if we start now, I think that could be a good sign that we are moving uh, in the right direction. I'm going to come back on that for one follow-up question on this. And I do see we, we're, we're starting to have a number of questions coming in. Um, thank you to the audience. Please feel free to send them in, uh, continue to send them in. I'm, I'm capturing them as best I can here, and we'll start getting to your to your questions quickly. Most of the questions we're getting in are related to the to the next step in the process, which is how do we recover? How do we come out of COVID in a, in a more sustainable uh, way? And so we'll turn to that part of the conversation in a minute. But I want to follow up on the subsidy question with, with the with the tactical question, which is, do you see any political will uh, at the moment to do things differently from um, what we've seen before? I remember um, 2015, 2016, we had extraordinarily low uh, oil prices uh, for a moment when I moved, moved into the White House. They were down at around the $30 a barrel uh, level, and um, there was a big push uh, within certain diplomatic circles, and we, we, we didn't get very far. So. Do you think this time could be different in terms of fossil fuel subsidy reform, or are we going to hit, hit, hit against the same barriers? Honestly, it's difficult to say. My understanding that the politicians feel that this could be a good moment for doing that. But if we look at what's happening in Europe now, where we have the debates on eurobonds, MES, what kind of measure they can put in place, uh, this kind of debate is a little bit uh, putting in a, in a second order uh, the one of uh, subsidy. But the, the question is still there, and I will try to explain why it's there. You know, this crisis is an economical crisis. It's not like the one of 2008, where the, the crisis was financial and then moved to the economic. So we have to preserve the financial side. So when we have uh, the liquidity that we have now, there is a tremendous amount of liquidity. With the cost of money, it's very, very low. Mm -hmm. There is no sense to move in the direction of the financial sector. What we have to create is a fiscal space for providing for political inputs. So you could have to move on subsidies on tax. In this case, is again at zero because you are moving from one sector to the another, but without, uh, to say, increase the burden to the citizen. Mm -hmm. So it's a political choice. It is the right moment to do. For the reason we know, and this is something that's uh, hopefully maybe also to be understood in the debate, that we have to work to enlarge the fiscal room of maneuver and not trying to transfer the economical crisis to the financial part of the reality. Good. Um, I'm going to do. I'm going to hold off for another two or three minutes in terms of transitioning to the to the post-COVID recovery conversation and ask you a couple of questions that have come in from the audience um, here related to we we talk always about solar and wind 
um, uh, as the as the as the two key renewable energy industries. There's obviously a lot of other um, uh, technologies and 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 proven and emerging uh, technologies that are that that comprise the renewable energy industry as a whole. I wonder if you could speak to some of the other uh, some of the other. Uh, industries uh, that you track and that you see and the promise that they hold or don't hold for uh, the future of uh, low carbon uh, uh, energy. The questions we have are, are around such things as uh, as hydrogen, as biomass, uh, biofuels, uh, et cetera. So uh, maybe you could speak for, for a bit and, and nuclear um, uh, uh, as well. Does IRENA take a position on the merits of those technologies? Um, uh, how, do you, how do you think about non-solar and wind based I, I, mm -hmm. If I can, I will also uh, add to, uh, naturally when we talk about renewables, we talk about not only wind and solar, we talk about everything. In the context of, uh, of renewables, I think that uh, hydropower is playing also a, a, a big role. Is uh, Where there is a lot of hydropower, it's easier to get flexibility in the system. We have now to understand the hydropower, the lot of plants have to be renewed. They provide electricity, they provide water for, uh, for, uh, the, the, for uh, drinking water, they provide water for uh, agriculture, they provide for, uh, water for industry, they provide electricity. And all the plants have to be renewed. So they are very, very important. Concerning bio, biofuel, that's absolutely also important. What I'm thinking, if I have to refer to it, where we are going to bail out or to support the the uh, plant, the transport company, their plant companies. So it's important if you give support, the support has to be linked also to goal in terms of uh, a environmental goal to be achieved. In this context, biofuel could be one of the of the uh, elements to be put in this uh, in this uh, in this negotiation in this making poli policies and when we talk about hydrogen hydrogen could be very very important but naturally i think we have to be clear on this hydrogen could be brown could be blue could be green when we talk about hydrogen we talk about green hydrogen that is the uh, best way to have uh, this uh, resource that can be used as fuel, but also as a storage, and that can really, uh, I, we say, uh, ensure a clean energy system. We, as Arena, we have worked on green hydrogen. We have worked in the G20 context. We have uh, uh, provided reports on the deep decarbonization because hydrogen could be very, very useful when we talk about long shipping transport, where we talk about heavy industries, where the electrification of the system is more difficult to be obtained. So green working on green hydrogen is ensuring a path for a deep decarbonization of the system. And in our global renewable outlook, we will uh, assess what could be the role of green hydrogen in this context? And that will be a very important role when we are going to the zero carbon emission in our, in our, in our systems. So all renewables may work together to uh, build a new energy system. And that, what I want to say, this is already ongoing. Good. So it's not... Yeah. Let, let me let me ask um, one more question related to, uh, to, to to this, and then and then I, I just got a bunch of questions that just came in as a batch related back to the subsidy question. So I want to come back to that in a moment. But but before we move on from from the, the, the this conversation, um, to talk a little bit about um, about uh, carbon capture, carbon sequestration, um, carbon storage. To what extent does the um, does Irena uh, take a position or have a view on the importance of um, and the role for uh, carbon capture in a future low carbon uh, uh, economy? Uh, we think that uh, uh, it may be useful, but this importance will be very limited. 
So the contribution of uh, CCS on uh, the decreasing of uh, the emission in our estimate in 2050 will be no more than three, four percent. In our point of view, this kind of plant will be limited to certain area where they may have economical significance. Because for the time being, if you go to a bank and ask for money for a CCUS plant, no one will give you the money. So because, because it's not economical, but in certain area of our planet, I mean the Gulf area, other possible area, in that context, they may contribute to lower the, 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 the emission. But we have to understand that it's not a solution. It's a complement to the existing solutions. Should subsidies that are currently targeted to the fossil fuel industry be uh, be um, applied toward uh, to helping develop that technology in a meaningful way uh, in, in, in future years? But why we have to do this when we have renewables that are much cheaper? Why we need this? I mean, the, 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 the argument that I hear is that we, we need both. We, we, need, we need to be... Yes, but uh, we need both, and there is no doubt that we need both. But we have not to make efforts to make a, a, a sector to be alive where we are moving slowly, but we are moving to a different energy system. So the fact is that we have to learn that we cannot assess our future if you have our eyes looking back. <laughs> so what is back is back. The world is changing. And what is happening now, uh, this tragedy, in some way, give also the chance to accelerate this, uh, this process to a new energy system, more resilient, more affordable, more clean. Good. Well, let's, let me let me go back to some of the questions around the economics and the subsidy question because we did I did get a bunch of questions there that came in uh, just a moment ago. So I'm going to ask uh, two or three questions that have come in from the audience, Francesco. Maybe you can you can make a note of them and then and then answer them in turn. Um, the, the the question is uh, number first question if if and and I'll quote some of these if the renewable sector is so competitive economically what is the justification for continuing to subsidize them? You, you mentioned repurposing some of the current fossil fuel subsidies, for example, and applying them to renewables. Um, so why are those why are those funds necessary to support an industry that is economically uh, self self sufficient? Question number one, uh, another uh, participant asked the question, um, is there anywhere a listing an easy access uh, of data on fossil fuel subsidies paid by uh, by various countries? Um, this person is looking for information on where 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 he can track and get better insights into into the the scope of uh, fossil fuel subsidies paid by various countries. Um, and then the third question, there's a couple of these that came in related to this topic, which is a lot of countries currently uh, receive a significant tax income from taxing fossil fuels. And so um, as, those, uh, as the use of fossil fuels goes down, um, that is a, a, a potentially significant loss, uh, source of lost revenue for those, um, for those countries. Um, what, what, how does Irina think think through the implications of that of that lost fiscal income um, in light of this uh, this transition that's going on? Maybe you could address those briefly, and then we'll then we'll move on to the to the Corona conversation. Concerning the 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 shift from the subsidies to uh, the brown economy to the clean economy, we are not saying that we have to subsidize the renewables as such. What we are saying is we have to build the infrastructure of the future for facilitating the penetration of the renewable to the system. So it's not, now there is no question, renewables are more convenient than other form of producing energy in four fifth of the planet. So this cannot be discussed because this is an opinion. This is not an opinion, is a fact. If you want to accelerate this process that in the market will inevitably be there is to make the shift in terms of infrastructure, investment in research that may provide the necessary push to accelerate our path. So it's not subsidies as such, but build the environment where renewables may better penetrate and fit in the energy system. 
Concerning the fossil fuels, uh, we have not provided our own study. So I suggest that you can go to the OECD and you will have the, 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 the complete. Uh, uh, but in our work, we have the estimate on what is there, about 15 trillions for perverse subsidies. And the, the number are, are absolutely real. Concerning the taxes, that uh, for the use of fossil fuel is uh, uh, diminishing. So uh, it's a fiscal question, uh, naturally. And that's true that the revenue can be can uh, diminish. At the same time, we can diminish the effort to support the system. So we have to work to look at it globally. So globally, we have some gain and some losing. The fact is how we can profit of this for making the ship take the, 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 the right direction. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So let's 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 transition a little bit over now to to the to the question to the question of how we emerge from coronavirus uh, and and um, the question that we're getting I'd say seventy percent of the questions are related to the to this question of how do we uh, how do we ensure that the investments made in the next six to twelve to eighteen months are are made in as sustainable and productive a, ma a manner as possible. And so I wonder, maybe you could just start by, by um, some perspectives on uh, how is IRENA looking at these uh, various packages? What, what role are you playing in helping to um, advise on them or steer them? Um, and what are your hopes and fears about what may uh, emerge from these uh, various packages over the next, over the next several months? I, I would just say as, a, as an editorial note here, while you prepare some thoughts, I, I think um, those the smart people that I know in climate circles, um, uh, climate finance circles, um, see this moment as perhaps the single most pivotal and crucial one, um, you know, of the last 20 years when it comes to the future direction of the global economy as it relates to uh, car climate change and low carbon opportunities. We, we have a tremendous opportunity here to get things right and a tremendous opportunity to, um, to, to as you said, look out the back of our head. Um, and so I wonder what role IRENA is playing in this process and what you see as some of the key dynamics that are developing uh, in these ongoing discussions about targeting of the stimulus funds or the recovery funds. So we have to distinguish uh, two, two aspects. One is concerning the cash, that in some way we have to distribute because there is people that is uh, getting to be unemployed people that have to close their activities. So we have to, have to say, ensure that they will not suffer too much. So there is a problem of cash. I don't want to say helicopter money, but more or less some money that has to be going to the system to make uh, the people suffering less. You talk about investment. When we talk about investment, it's more complex to respond. So what investment are we thinking about? If we talk about what kind of investment has to be in the list, inevitably, you have to think about the future you want. Because uh, the tragedy of the COVID has put the economy really on its own knees. So now we have to start in which direction we have to be. Think of the Pacific, in the Pacific. Now we are, they are struggling against two existential, existential threats, the virus and the impact of climate change with the typhoon and, and others. So we have to imagine a world that could be resilient to this threat and overcome them. So when we talk investment is on the future you want. And what we are going to transmit to the government as a sign of hope that we can work also in this tragedy for having a better world. The fears are naturally that the lobbies and other may try to get the last penny from this situation. And this up to the people to be careful, the NGOs, political party, the politician to work having in mind the need of a, a bright future for, for the people. But naturally the fears are there. So controlling what's happening is very important. What ARENA can do? We, will, uh, we are trying to send this message. 
One is concerning linking the uh, short term with the medium long term. We are coming in, a, in a two weeks now with our uh, global renewable outlook. There is very well designed in terms of where we have to go and how we have to get there. So there is a medium long term plan for the policy measures. In the same time, we feel that we have to link in more, uh, it's possible in a more clear way, in a clear way, the medium and long term figure with what's happening now. And we will come after the global renewable outlook with a document that will be uh, more, uh, let's say, smaller than the outlook, but where we put the necessary link between among the short and medium and long term. And this will be offered to the, the politicians. We are trying also to introduce this concept. You know, we have to work on the indices. And we, as ARENA, we are working with UNDP in the context of the climate promise to renew and possibly make them more ambitious, the indices to be presented to the UNFCC. The COP has been postponed, but not the obligation to present the NDCs because this is in the treaty. So what is important for us is to transmit the message that yes, the NDCs are not something out of the stimulus package, but they are the stimulus package when we talk about the future of the energy system. So this is a message that we are going to transmit how we are trying to do this. One with our report and publications. Be present in this uh, interview to transmit our messages. We are calling ministers. We are participating in all forums. We have our coalition for action, where we have stakeholders coming from private companies, coming from a uh, uh, government body, where we are working together and we will come with a statement possibly next week. So we are trying to disseminate the message. The message is very clear is link the short with the medium or long term path and make this to be coherent. So we don't need right policies. We need not to make wrong choices mm -hmm. because inevitably we are going in, a, in the right direction. Well, let's let's talk about that. I mean, I, I don't want to preempt your I don't want to preempt your your reports that are coming out and 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 the the uh, the content of those reports. But I but I actually do want to get some insights from what 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 you are uh, about to be saying more more publicly um, because I think the question the question here is what specifically um, are the the types of um, the warnings that you're giving um, and and recommendations that you'll be providing related to stimulus funding? I think I think it's fairly well um, understood within again within the within the climate community broadly that this is a big opportunity. There's also a big risk. We need to be careful. We need to be strategic. We need to be forward looking. What does that mean uh, from a from a policy perspective? What have we learned in the past? Uh, about uh, uh, policies that have that have been particularly effective at both uh, serving jobs, uh, equity considerations, supporting socioeconomic um, uh, 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 policy needs, uh, but also driving um, uh, climate progress. Are there specific recommendations that you can highlight for us that you think might be part of this uh, set of reports? I think we have, and uh, naturally, the trend is for us, where we have to go, is for the electrification of the system, fuel by renewables, and the consumption of energy coming in 2050 50 for two thirds by renewables. This is the way we have, we have to get to the, get the, the combination of economy with many measures. But the message that we want to, to give also uh, uh, very clearly, that sometime when we talk about the use of fossil fuel plant or the fossil fuel system. And the renewables, renewables one is just a question of technology. It is not. It is not just a question of technology. It's a question of how we intend the relationship with, between the human and the economic activities. And when we, in our 
global renewable output. We make clear that we have been seeing the jobs growing, increasing in the last few years from uh, 4 million, 2 million to 11 now. We estimate, we assess, and this number are credible, that we can cut, uh, make four times the uh, people working on renewables in 2050. And if we had the people that we work on energy efficiency, we will see that the impact, the social impact will be huge. In this time where the people is losing jobs, the most rapid and most effective way for providing jobs and going for a sector that may occupy more people. We have seen that women in renewables have a share of employment higher the traditional one. We have seen that the GDP, if we go that path, will be growing faster and better if we go for, uh, for renewables. So there are many, many reasons and insights to let the politician afford the, the choice for accelerate the path to a clean energy system. Let's let's talk a little bit about um, th those are the good those are the reasons why this makes sense economically and otherwise. There's obviously a, a number of barriers to to this to this happening. Um, often they are political, they are interest groups, they are um, they are uh, industrial bases that are under threat and under attack. And and we, we see that certainly in our in our own country. Um, we see that in countries around the world. I do a lot of work in South Africa, and that's a a clear dynamic uh, at play in in South Africa where. Um, uh, where you have an uneconomical um, uh, coal-based um, uh, you know, energy system, and yet the transition to what is a clearly superior and lower cost uh, solar and wind-based um, energy system with amazing assets is just politically extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult to get there. Um, you have to confront the as uh, the socioeconomic issues related to this transition. And I know that Irene has done a lot of thinking around that issue. Maybe you could say a bit about um, how Irina considers the, so, the, 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 the equity issues and the socioeconomic um, uh, issues in various countries as, a, as, a, as an obstacle to um, the energy transformation that you, that you are pushing for. Uh, you, you are absolutely correct, John. And I will invite to, to think about for a moment, if we are large, the our point of view and consider all the world. So this virus is going everywhere. What's about Africa? How we can think the future, our future, without have learned from the today situation that we have to connect, we have to express solidarity, we have to work together. If we don't bring a clean or support the establishment of a clean energy system in Africa. More than 60% of the health facilities in Africa has problems with the electricity. People are scolded to wash their hands. They have not the water. So when we talk about the response, as to be the response of the world, we have not just looked at our country. So the question of equity, of the just transition is there. When there is people losing jobs and we want them back, we want to send back to the same sector where the crisis has made, made clear that a sector that are not resilient, or you want to move to these people to jobs that may provide more opportunities in terms of resilience, so jobs that have a real future. I'm thinking about this. So it's very important that uh, when we design the responses and this aspect, I think that uh, the new European Green Deal may uh, play an important role if they will uh, continue in that line to show that working on the domestic or regional area, we have not to forget that we cannot think about to be alone because we are not. So it's important that the fight against inequality has to be a fight to be conducted. And uh, renewables 
for the capacity to be deployed in a very short term. When you project and then you implement a plant, in six, eight months, you will be solar and wind already there. This means a lot for, for countries that have not the basic need. When we talk about access to energy, we have not to look and consider only, only our world. We have to consider the 100 million people that still don't have access to the basic energy services. So all this has to be part of the reasoning. So if we want a world more sustainable, cannot be sustainable if it's not just. So we have to think about our country and how our country can uh, uh, support the others in uh, getting a, a better energy system. Francesco, do you see evolving models of best practices with respect to just transitions uh, around the world? It's, it is such a commonly talked about, I mean, I'm on probably five phone calls a day where the term just transition comes up and everyone nods their heads and says, yes, we need, we're committed to a just transition. Uh, but it's, it's, I think if you ask five different people what that means, you're going to get six different answers um, and, and six different answers to the question of to what extent is it the responsibility of these new energy systems to have an answer to the question of what a just transition is. I mean, we look now, you brought up Africa, somewhere between a half and two thirds of, uh, of, of Africans don't have reliable access to electricity today. Um, that's not a very just situation either, but, but people don't look to the fossil fuel industry and say, you know, that's your fault. Um, now renewables comes in and people are concerned rightly about the just transition and about affected workers. Um, and I feel like to some extent um, it's incumbent upon um, th these industries to, to come in with, with an answer to the question of how they will uh, transition the economies in, in, as, in as clean, clear, and equitable a manner as possible. So I wonder, do you see models emerging of successful just transitions where legacy industries have been drawn down, renewables have come in, and uh, that, that are kind of a model for what you'd like to see going forward in, in developing countries around the world? Yes, we, we have such a spirit. But uh, first, uh, allow me that naturally when we talk about just and define what just is, we come with very different yeah. interpretation of justice. I remember uh, uh, I read the book of uh, Martia Sen uh, a few years ago, but sometime if you cannot define what is just, try to define what is not just. That could be easier. So it's just, it's, it's not just people as not energy, the basic energy services. So trying to understand what we cannot accept in our moral. So what we think is really not just. Concerning the model, we have experimented in our activities in the small islands, how the introduction of renewables has created supply chain where this has been accompanied with capacity building at a small economies has been going up. So naturally, when uh, it's not just a question to put a plant, but just a question to provide the support needed. Just a good example, Morocco. They were coming from a crisis a few years ago, very deep economic crisis. They went to renewables. Now they are one of the most modern economy, surely in, in the North Africa context. So those are the models that uh, we have to showcase to the other countries, the neighbor. This is the reason for ARENA, having clustering, its membership in 14 cluster, because we want showcase the good example of uh, one country to, to, to the others. And uh, one other way is trying to provide a just financial flow resources to investment in the poorest part of the world. In this respect, if you allow me, John, I would like to talk about one initiative of ARENA. I will take two minutes. Yeah. It's, it's uh, uh, what we launched with uh, UNDP, c for all and GCF, the occasion of the last climate summit, is the climate investment platform. We have launched on our website, that's a website, the work of ARENA on the platform. 
And uh, in less than five weeks, in this deficient, difficult moment, we have received 250 requests to become partner of the platform. Stakeholders, but mainly, if I can say mainly, multilateral financial institution, bank, investor, private companies, 250 partners that believe that the renewables are the future. We have opened 14 online platforms to put idea for project. In two weeks, 120 ideas. So, Irina, because one of the questions that you want to pose, what we are doing? So, first of all, it's provide the most honest data, clean and honest data. So, the, the, the politician can access where they, they, they may go and where they cannot go. In the same time, we will provide the policy measures that we think can be drive the progress from now to a decarbonized economy. At the same time, and this thanks to our knowledge basis, it is a tremendous knowledge basis. In the same time, we are trying to go, to go more on the field and play this role of facilitators through the climate investment platform. We will going to, to convene our investment forum starting from the first quarter of the next year. We hope that this could be a way to uh, provide the necessary financial resources to the poorest part of the world for building a, 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 a more just energy, energy system in their countries. Excellent. Well, look, look, good luck on that. We'll look forward to we'll look forward to seeing and hearing more more about it in the in the days and uh, I guess the weeks weeks to come. Um, we, we have about uh, eight minutes left. I've got a couple more questions. I've been able to get to I think about only about a quarter of the questions that have come in. I'm going to try to ask some uh, some some final questions here, uh, Francesco, and then give you give you two minutes at the end to uh, to say any closing remarks that you that you might like to have. Um, uh, there have been a number of questions regarding. Uh, concerns, technical concerns about the limitations of renewables today, specifically regarding kind of inter intermittency issues, um, which uh, are, are, are well founded. Um, the question then becomes back to batteries. Um, to what extent um, does do do further innovations in battery technology? To what extent are further innovations in battery technology essential in order to see the level of renewable deployment that IRENA is um, is projecting and, uh, and and pushing for. So maybe just a brief word on batteries, uh, and then we'll take a couple more questions before we wrap. Uh, uh, first, uh, concerning the technical aspects, this uh, I think we discussed a little bit uh, a few days ago. This is absolutely a myth. So. Ten years ago, people said that the grid cannot support more than 10% of renewables into the grid. False. Now we have seen, we imagine that until 30, 35%, there is no really problem. Germany has demonstrated we can go 52% in this first quarter, uh, trimester, trim, uh, quarter of uh, 2020. So naturally, the penetration of the renewable can be facilitated. So when we are talking about the barrier, what we talked in the beginning of our conversation today, why we don't invest in infrastructure? And when I talk about infrastructure, I mean the, uh, the charger for, uh, for the electric vehicles. We need to update our grid because they are also in the old system. They were supposed to do this. And now is the moment that we can leapfrog and go to a renewal that is building a structure that is compatible with the need of the penetration of renewable. Uh, John, be clear. 50 years ago, we have been able to go to the moon. Can, can you believe that today we are not able to build and manage a smart grid? Fair, fair point. And I do, I do, I do, I mean, I, I certainly, you're asking me, so I'll answer. I'll say, no, I do not believe we are incapable of that. I believe we are capable of that. <laughs> Concerning the storage, we have assisted in a very rapid decrease of the price of storage. 
70 percent in a few years. They are going. The prices are going down, down. The batteries are becoming more powerful, powerful. So there is not a technical limit to the penetration of renewables. Naturally, we have to work because we need the interconnection. We need the necessary flexibility, but we have the means for doing that. Maybe we could end here with a question, a, a somewhat uh, a, a question that is related to the um, the recent, uh, I would say, turn inward of uh, of, of countries um, during the coronavirus uh, um, uh, moment. There has been a noticeable, I would say, um, uh, decrease in trust in in uh, at least short term trust in multilateralism, globalism, and international institutions. Um, and um, to what extent do you see that continuing um, and affecting IRENA's work as a fact-based data-driven uh, organization a seek seeking to inform a, a, a transition? Do you find that your work or you fear that your work has been affected or will be affected negatively by the, uh, by the concerns about international institutions uh, and, and, and global institutions more generally? This is a very, really good question. Uh, I think that we will be not affected because we are a very peculiar organization. We have 161 members. We are becoming two more in a few weeks. But uh, what is important, we have all the component, the actor of the energy system. In We have the private companies. We have the NGOs. We have the technicians. We have the investors. So we are part of a family. We are, we are all working together. If we, if we just going back three months ago, we have a very successful assembly. We are now building, a working and on building a working group on green hydrogen. And everyone wants to, to be in. We are working on ocean, ocean energy. Everyone got to be in. We are working on the geopolitical consequences of going for mine, a mineral for batteries and other rare earth. And they all want to work and be in part of this job. So adding an organization with this peculiar status, high up will, uh, will make ARENA not to be affected by uh, the discussion that is ongoing at the forum. Good. I think that's a optimistic way to, way, to, way to close. Do you have any final, final thoughts or, 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 or perspectives you'd like to share with us before we, before we wrap? Um, I'll give you the floor for, for just a minute here. Yeah, yeah I, I will be very, very fast. I, my message for who is listening is definitely it's possible moving to a clear and just world. We have to believe it and make all in our capacity the best for making this possible. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and your perspectives and for joining us today from uh, from Abu Dhabi, where you are based. I should have should have mentioned that at the top. Um, thanks for an enjoyable conversation. Thanks to the participants who who weighed in with questions. I'm sorry for those of you whose questions I didn't get to, but I, I think we got to a, a fair number of them. Um, if you would like to rewatch today's event or uh, or share the stream with a colleague, you can find a cash replay on the Atlantic Council website and YouTube channel. Um, for those of you who have uh, appetite for yet another or further Zoom uh, Atlantic Council uh, events, um, you can join us today at 11 uh, a.m. Eastern for the second installment in Energy Source Innovation Stream, where Bill Brown, the CEO of NetPower, uh, will discuss his, his vision for the electoral uh, molecular economy. Um, I just want to pause and say, say uh, big thanks to the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center for hosting this event, uh, the event staff, and entire Atlantic Council Global Energy Center uh, staff, including Jackson Styron, Tom Knoll, Ray Johnson, and Zach Strauss for, for helping set this up. Um, thanks everyone for your participation and particularly to you, Mr. LaCamera, for your time and perspectives um, in these troubled, but, um, but what I hear from you is uh, potentially quite uh, uh, optimistic times with respect to the growth of the renewable energy industry globally. Thank you, everyone. Please stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, we'll, we'll connect again soon. Take care. Ciao, John. Grazie. Ciao. Thanks.